Well, uh, thank you very much indeed. And a special thank you to all the organizers, uh, Gerald and any others for preparing this conference. We're all very grateful, I'm sure, that we're at least here virtually. There's been no break that I'm aware of in the conference for goodness me, the 30 years probably that I've been coming. And this is the place where we try to get all the new ideas by sharing ideas with all our colleagues who are working in different fields, both commercial programmers and academics. And so this conference has always been very valuable to me in terms of ideas. So I'm very, very grateful that it's uh, still happening. So, uh, as you can see, or as you saw from Mattermost, I, uh, I uh, set the, the cat among the pigeons yesterday by uh, proposing uh, a talk in uh, Latin, which I really wasn't up to, because uh, although I did actually get a grade A at O-level Latin, it was rather a large number of years ago. And I do have a friend, actually, who speaks Latin at home with his best mates and all the rest of it. But uh, the last time I went to see him, I was not able to keep up, I'm afraid. Perhaps you have to actually work at the Vatican in order to keep in practice. Anyway, so 64-bit and uh, my, my beta copy of 64-bit fourth arrived just a few days ago. And this is the first thing that I actually typed in. And as you can see, this is a, a rather, rather large number. But I suppose uh, the first thing we have to do is say, uh, why do we need 64-bit in the first place? And I see that despite my uh, learning all about the uh, buttons, they are not working. So I shall have to press something instead. Well, what we actually don't need is all those numbers that I just threw across the screen there, because the numerical accuracy required in our uh, in our applications at the moment is perfectly ad adequate at 32 bits. Uh, likewise, the addressing range is also perfectly adequate at the moment. Uh, the problem is uh, that increasingly it's very difficult to set up an operating system. The operating systems are all 64 bit these days, basically it's very, very difficult to set up an operating system with 32-bit libraries. Um, a year or two ago, it was probably relatively straightforward, but with each new issue of the operating system, for example, Ubuntu, we're on, on uh, Ubuntu 20.1 now, I think it is. Um, and the last time we installed everything there, it was phenomenally annoying. And in fact, one library doesn't work at all. So we need the 64-bit fourth basically to deal with the uh, operating system and library interfaces. Um, well, we have been, um, is it lobbying the right word or something like that um, for 64-bit for a couple of years now. And uh, as soon as we knew that this was uh, in the offing, we started the preparation. So although we only actually received our beta copy just a few days ago. Uh, we have been trying to prepare for 64-bit for probably a year now. And so we thought to ourselves, well, what do we actually need to do? And as usual, we looked at our previous experience in converting between different sizes of fourth. And we remembered that in 1993, prior to that, we'd been using 16-bit Fig fourth, or similar to Fig fourth, our, our own home cooked versions of fourth, on things like the 6809 and the 6502. And suddenly we had to convert to 32 bit fourth um, on, um, I think it was Windows 3.1 uh, plus Win32S. And I remember this was quite a challenge, but I can't remember anything about what we did. So I have to say that previous experience is really no help at all here. So we tried to look for critical differences. And the really the real big gotcha here is that when you go to 64 bit, an int is no longer the same size as a cell. Um, ints remain as 32 bits and cells are now 64 bits. So where in the past you used fetch and store, to work on an int 
that no longer works. The second critical difference that we identified is that we were careless, not carelessly, we were, we were happily adding lots and lots and lots of external declarations for library functions. And we were being perhaps a tiny little bit lazy because instead of uh, accurately uh, creating all the new uh, types that are necessary uh, for declaring external declarations, we were just using int all over the place. And that doesn't work anymore because some of them are actually not int. They're all sorts of different things. And in particular, enumerations, of course, are not ints anymore. And the third critical difference is, of course, uh, this magical thing, which has a little underscore T on the end of it. And basically what this appears to mean is that we can use uh, a different size of element, depending on uh, the size of the application that you're using there. And so uh, something with a T in 32-bit is 32-bit, and something with a T in 64-bit is 64-bit. And so all those things actually need manually changing. But the good news is uh, those of you who work in Linux uh, will be no doubt aware that Linux has Linux 32-bit had a, two th a year 2038 problem. Some of you might remember the 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 dreaded year 2000 problem when we spent hours going through our code and discovering that there was nothing wrong with it at all. Well, Linux really does have a year 2038 problem because time in Linux can be expressed in terms of the number of seconds since the time when Linus Torvalds woke up one morning with a good idea. Uh, but that problem, of course, goes away as soon as you're in 64 bit. So what were our proposed solutions? And this is where uh, I'm, I'm just looking at all the shared screens now and waiting for you to all throw up your hands in horror. Ready? Three, two, one. Throw up your hands in horror now, please, because one of my proposed solutions is to, is to get rid of fetch and store. And in fact, um, ever since we started using values a few years ago, um, I've really loved values instead of variables. And so uh, that gets rid of um, fetch, of course, and store is replaced by this funny little pointer thing. Um, but having got rid of all your variables, and it, it's um, all the variables in our actual application have been got rid of. There are one or two variables, of course, in the in the fourth itself, which you can't which you can't get rid of. Uh, but after that, we were left with a much smaller number of fetches and stores, and that made it much easier for us um, to convert all those to have an explicit size. Now, it was a bit unfortunate that we went through all our code and changed everything to I fetch and I store for integer fetch and integer store, and then discovered that Stephen had actually called it L fetch and L store instead. But it's, you know, it's not a lot of work there. So that was solution number one. Actually, and then we thought of a much more radical solution, which was to actually to get rid of fetch and store completely. Um, because what you then still, even if you haven't got variables, you still need fetch and store for the elements of structures and that kind of thing. And so um, in my main paper a little bit later, uh, amongst other things, I'm going to describe how we uh, redo structures to use value-like elements instead of uh, variable-like elements. Uh, so the next thing we did, of course, was we had to go through every, well, we are still going through every single extern and checking it against the prototypes to see that they match exactly, and going through all the type definitions. And now we had to do them all, of course, there are simply hundreds of these to ensure that they are actually the correct size. And finally, we had to go through, of course, all the things um, uh, which had T at the end of it and make sure that they are now 64-bit instead of 32-bit. And that's about it, really. 
as I mentioned, we've only actually had the 64 bit fourth there up for a, a few days uh, yet. And so um, in the list of include files, I think it got about as far as the fourth include file. That is the the fourth I, as in one, two, three, four include file before it actually fell over. And uh, that is as far as I've got in my investigation so far. But the fact that it actually managed to compile um, three include files before falling over, I thought was a, a fairly sort of promising thing. So there we are. That's the end of my first brief talk. And it's really quite exciting to be working with a whole new thing. And um, I'm sure that uh, once we've got it all going, it's actually going to be a great deal easier. And I'm hoping, although I shall probably be not around to, to tell, that in, in 27 years time, it might be easier for when, when people move up to convert 228 bit. So there you go, chaps. Uh, do we ask for questions now? Uh, what do we do? So, are there any questions? Uh, Bernd? I checked in my log for GeForce. We did finish the 64-bit thing uh, 25 years ago. So just two years after you converted from 16 <laughs> to 32 bits. <laughs> alas, alas, I have often looked, but I, I have never been able to understand your method for declaring externs. So there we are. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gerald? Uh, can I ask why you are not using SWIG, which will make your life so much more easier and automatically convert everything for you? Do you know, um, people often um, mention things like that to me. And the first thing is that, of course, I have not the faintest idea what they're talking about. And the second thing is that usually I've done all the work and then somebody says to you, oh, well, why didn't you do it this way? So you can tell me afterwards what what on earth you're talking about there, please. Uh, I will. It's an automatically. Uh, so basically, what it does, it takes a C header, and makes an external interface for you with one button press. And CCS was kind enough to even sponsor a version which is for Windows, which is called WinSwig, which is even I think I think it's two buttons because you have to select the header and then press it. Anyway, I shall tell you this offline. Just wanted to know. Thank you very much okay. indeed. Oh, I understand what you're talking about now, but um, yeah, I mean, basically with the externs there, we we don't normally bring all of them in. We just bring in the ones which we're actually um, using. Ulrich, you did have a question. Yeah, uh, a, a remark maybe if you can go to the initial slide. Um, um, I think uh, one thing to remember is that there are also sometimes very subtle bugs. And uh, if you read this, uh, you would think that minus one is put on the stack. And uh, so this is the, we see the 64-bit representation of minus one. But it actually isn't. Because minus one dot zero is minus 10. Mm, and we see the very, very good point. bit representation of minus 10. So actually, I should have put in minus 0.1. Oh, minus 1 dot. No, you, oh, should, have put, you, should, you should have put in minus 1, minus 1. <laughs> that? Maybe. Yeah. Um, so um, do you have any tests that can assure that the transition that you make uh, really work? Do you have tests at, at hand that, that verify what's going on? Or do you just say, OK, we see the system crash, in, and then we know something is still wrong? Uh, I mean, we're going to have to test this very carefully. Um, this is not something which we'll roll out in front of a customer anytime soon, I don't think. I would have thought uh, we're about six months away mm -hmm. uh, from installing it. and. Uh, basically, it's actually um, our, the applic our applications are very difficult to test um, in the office on the bench. 
Yeah, uh, because yeah. there's an enormous amount of interaction with physical equipment, which is very, very difficult to simulate. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, we'll we'll test every function as best we can on the bench, and then we will select some poor, innocent customer who doesn't realize what he's getting and is not too far away from us uh, and has a system which is relatively straightforward. And uh, uh, he is the guinea pig, although he doesn't know it yet. He might get a discount for it, but he won't know that either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. of course, having lot, lots of hardware attached uh, limits the, the, the amount of automatic testing that you could do or testing on the bench. That's right. Yeah. Okay, uh, just a moment uh, before I get to you, uh, Andrew. Gerard has uh, forgotten to do something. Yes, I forgot to do something very important uh, because as this time we are online. Sorry, uh, turn it off again, Claudia, please. It has to be official. Yes, I would like to light the official Euroforce LED right now. Okay, <laughs> that's it. And it will stay on during the whole conference. So. This is the all physical flow we all get together. And in case you did not get the reference, it's of course from the IT crowd where the internet is in a box. But yeah, just so you know that there's something physical representation. Thank you. <laughs> all right, uh, Andrew. Thank you. So th th thanks, Nick. Very interesting. I've, I've also got a question about your customers. How, how will you persuade all of your customers to upgrade? Well, presumably they have to upgrade the underlying operating system to take advantage of your 64-bit versions. And if half of them don't, do you end up with twice as much work to support now a 64-bit version and a 32-bit version and have to push out enhancements onto both? How, how do you bring your customers around to all this? That's what I'm curious about. Oh, OK. Uh, I mean, we don't do free upgrades. And systems are not um, upgraded all at the same time. Uh, so basically, um, our business involves automating machinery, and the machinery has a life expectancy of about 20 years. Whereas the automation hardware, um, that is the programmable logic controllers and the industrial PCs and things like that, have a lifetime of about 10 years. Uh, so generally speaking, um, we will offer customers a complete and thorough upgrade about halfway through the life of the equipment after about 10 years. Uh, so uh, there's not an issue really. Oh, of course, uh, I mean, we're normally supplying all the IT hardware as well. Uh, you can't just go out and uh, buy an ordinary um, desktop PC and stick it on a factory floor and expect it to work for any length of time, really. So the PCs that we're using are um, fairly sort of uh, heavyweight stuff. And uh, so basically we set, we set the whole thing up. And uh, in the case, um, we're just moving to Linux at the moment. Um, we have systems um, running on uh, Linux, but our main application um, has been Windows until um, just recently, really. Uh, so um, when we start doing main applications um, in Linux, our idea is actually instead of using the latest version of Ubuntu or something like that, we will actually cook our own Linux. So that's basically the background of the way we're, the way we're expecting to go about it. I should say, by the way, that um, perhaps I haven't explained to everybody that I am no longer the boss. And for the first time in my entire career, I have a job. So this is something that you've got to get used to a little bit. So um, our son, uh, since last September, um, owns the business, and I am merely an employee now. Um, so um, I'm not quite sure what he's uh, what he's going to do. Um, he's not uh, a great coding enthusiast himself, um, but he is a bit of a, a Linux and network expert. So um, hopefully he'll solve all those problems. And he is coming round um, to fourth. He demonstrated to me just the other day that he could do two two plus dot. So it looks like we're oh, is, is there any further questions? 
So, um, are there any questions? Oh, Gerard has one. Yes, just one more question. Are we going to uh, see your son eventually on the conference anytime? Um, it's it's possible. Um, I think um, I was quite surprised that one of our other engineers didn't volunteer to take part at the moment, but he's actually just come back from doing a, a system commissioning in uh, Sweden and he was out in Sweden for about uh, two or three weeks. And uh, so I think he's actually taking a bit of a, a breather at the moment. We had rather a dramatic situation because we were doing a large installation uh, for the, um, it was actually a contractor to the uh, Swedish National Health Service um, in a big factory just outside um, Stockholm in March. And um, we were about, about halfway through this. And fortunately, we hadn't switched the old system off quite um, yet. But this was looking more and more worrying, obviously. And so we decided we had to bring our crew home. We had four people out there, um, two, uh, two engineers and two electricians. And they pretty much came home on the last flight. Mm -hmm. But of course, Sweden has dealt with this crisis in a very different way from uh, the way we did in, in the UK. And, you know, to be honest, it, it looks reasonably successful, the Swedish method, but uh, they were really not, not locked down at all. And so they were phoning us up about every four, you know, every fortnight to say, when are you coming back to finish this job? And so um, when things started to get back a little bit to uh, normal, we thought, well, as soon as we possibly can, we better get this job finished because it is, after all, for the NHS. And uh, the old system which we're replacing, I have to say, this is not an upgrade of our own. This was um, another one of our competitors had put in the previous uh, job. And basically, it was falling over about two or three times a day. And so and it, it took him about, you know, an hour to put everything straight again after it had fallen over. So um, um, we looked at the possibilities. And uh, at the time, uh, there were no flights between the UK and Sweden. Uh, there were no ferries between the, new, the UK and Sweden. And uh, several of the countries, if you tried to drive around, several of the countries had their borders shut. And eventually we discovered that there was uh, actually a freight ferry company accepting only trucks. And so uh, what we did is uh, we went round to our local uh, um, van hire company and hired a large van so that it looked a bit like a truck. And we got a crew of just two people out there out to Sweden at the earliest possible opportunity. And uh, they've got uh, the system's working pretty nicely now, actually. So we're fairly... The customer seems fairly happy, and I'm hoping he's just about to give us another job. He, he has no idea, by the way, that it's programmed in fourth. So, are there any further questions? Any questions from Twitch? No. Just somebody saying right. hello. So, hello, and, Twitch again. <laughs> okay. And uh, I have one so, question. What is yes? The name of the fourth system that you developed, that's the 64-bit. Oh, uh, we're using uh, Stephen Pelk's uh, VFX fourth. Okay. There is a presentation about this on Wednesday. Ah, sorry, on sun Saturday, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any further questions? So th if uh, those who haven't don't have um, uh video on want to ask a question one way to do it would be to select your name and uh, um, then say you you want to raise your hand or something like that and, and set status and then raise your hand or you can just uh, start talking and hopefully nobody will uh, <laughs> will talk at the same time but i think and oh no andrew is just having a stretch this is this is rather like when you're at an auction, you know, and you have to sort of sit it on your hands to avoid accidentally <laughs> bidding something. I assure you, if I want to ask a question, you will have no doubt about it. <laughs> All right. So I guess uh, we don't have any more questions. So the next presentation is by um, by. Uh, hold on. Sorry, there is one question from Twitch coming in just okay. now. Do we still take it? Yes, certainly. 
Okay, we so the, the question is the pointer of your 64 bits for R64 bit too short or 32 bit? So I didn't quite understand the question. I was just re reading it literally. The pointer of your 64 bits for R64 bit 2 or 32 bits? So I guess he wants to know uh, the pointer size. Oh, the address range. Um, addresses are 64 bit. Okay. Thank you. So I hope that answers the question.